Oh, good morning. Uh, here we are, ready to relax and paint. So I'm going to be doing something a little different today. The last Monday and Wednesday I had been painting dragon eggs. Those are now done and off to the side. And now I'm going to be working on a dungeon set. <coughs> Uh, very much like the ones that we use on our Dungeons and Dragons stream, Twitch live chat, uh, Sundays at 2 p.m. So if you can, why don't you join us there? One I'm going to be working on is one we haven't done yet before. I'm going to slide it this way a little bit. We had it, I had it assembled, and then I'm going to move the camera around a little so you can see how big it is. Um, this is the Dungeon of Doom. So it's all primed in black, so you can't see too much on it, but you walk in here, and this is a special trap wall. This particular trap is a gas cloud. You get under my finger there, and you wander around in here and battle things and get mostly killed, and when you think everything's fine, you open this door, and you trigger a trap and oof, you get flamed and if you don't burn to a crisp you get to open this door and then when you finally get to this area i imagine that's where the dungeon master will probably put the boss fight and uh you'll have no place to hide so um i don't know tpk and it happens so what i'm going to be doing today is uh painting the walls and the floors this is not going to be nearly as colorful as the last couple of things I did. I'm going to be painting the walls gray, and there are a lot of walls. And then the floors are going to be what's called a field blue, which is a very, very dark blue What when you put a black wash over it. Um, it turns out to look like really nice stone. And um, then after the floors dry, I'm going to go back to the walls and paint in accent bricks, kind of just randomly scattered around uh, in a brown color, um, just to provide some variation and highlights. And then if there's time, we'll see how things go. Sometimes these go really fast, sometimes slow. I get to use a larger brush and move along fairly quickly. Um, I'm going to work on the doors, uh, the door frames, and the traps flame and the gas cloud. So right now I'm going to remove the flame and the gas cloud and show you one of these trap walls. These are kind of cool. It's hard to see right now <clears throat> but there's uh, an aperture there so that's going to be brass where the trap flame where gas cloud comes out. But the wall is removable so that when you are exploring the dungeon, you've just got this plain old blank wall held on by magnets. Okay, the post there helps align it and then the magnets. And then you're walking along and the dungeon master says, Oh, you weren't very careful. You didn't use your detect trap spell, even though, uh, you know, it's a cantrip and for you and you can do it all the time. And uh, you have just sprung uh, trap, and the trap shoots out a gas cloud, and you are now choking in the fumes of whatever that is. That's also held in by a magnet. You can't really see them, but there's a magnet inside there and a magnet here. They go together, and that's how it's held on. Okay, that's the magic of the show. Um... I'm going to put these back and get out the main paint today. The main paint is a Tamiya acrylic paint. Uh, goes on easily and smoothly. And we'll be covering all of these walls. And hopefully I'll be able to adjust this so that it will be on camera as I'm doing it. And again, as I said, after I'm done doing all these balls, I'm going to get out the uh, field blue paint with a small brush and paint the demarcation line between the wall and the floor. And then get the big brush out again and paint all the floors. I'm going to put on a glove this time. So 
notice no matter how careful one might be, and one isn't terribly careful while painting these walls in with the base color, I get paint all over my hands, which happens more often than not. It's really weird. Even though the brush doesn't come anywhere near my hands, paint jumps on top. Okay, uh, field blue. Shake it up. Wow. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to push this way up here. And it is going to lose its integrity as I start painting these pieces and set them aside. Don't want them touching each other before they dry. So this whole space will be taken up with uh, wall pieces. Not sure how I'm going to do these. Might just uh, let's see. Does this work? Yeah, I can kind of hold them on with these alligator clips. I need to hold them with something so that I can paint them all. Or maybe I'll just paint everything with the very tippy top, paint all around, put a piece of paper underneath, and then paint the top. But I'll worry about that later. There's a lot of other ones to get done. So, neutral gray. A lot of them. So you will get to watch this be applied in large quantities to stone walls with lots of little crevices that need to be filled in. Yeah, the, the print produces uh, really well-defined blocks. But I think I want to paint them as much as possible in the base color, even though when the wash comes in later and highlights them. Just to get some sense of uniformity before we get the variation, I'll be painting so that most of the demarcation lines, the mortar lines between the stone blocks are painted in. It doesn't have to be perfect because the black wash will highlight them again later. But there we go. That's what you'll be seeing for the next four hours, is walls and floors. And there is one quarter of a corner wall done. No, not quite, because I haven't done the edges yet, but that's how this will work. One thing I noticed watching like a replay of this is that after about the fifth one, this starts to feel kind of tedious, to be honest. And it feels like it takes forever. Um, but watching it on the, on the replay, it just goes really fast. So for you, it might look like it's really going quite quickly, but for me, after a little while, it'll look like it's taking forever to paint, especially these corners. And this particular set has nine corner tiles, which is as much as the other two sets that we've done put together. And if you've been watching when Nikki's been doing this, you've been Hearing her also exclaim how really amazingly long it feels to paint a corner. It's, all, it's basically two walls. Yeah, there's like one real wall, two real walls on, single walls on this set. So it's all corners and corridors and secret traps. And I've been reminded that I'm the one that designed this particular dungeon. And because of that, I have no right to whine about how hard it is to paint it. But I'll whine about it anyway. Yeah, allergies are nasty today. So, you know, you never know when I might just start sneezing or sniffling.
Hmm. Okay. So, look at that. Very close to having one out of nine of these done. I suppose the upside is that when I have nine out of nine of these done, I will have done almost the entire dungeon set. Okay, there we go. That's uh, that's the neutral gray. That's how it looks compared to when it's just prime. Now I just got uh, eight more of these, and then I'll get to do some just regular walls. No, oh, I miscounted. Two, one, two, three. There's actually four regular walls. Because I'm basically painting everything gray, and that will be going on for a while. I don't have too much to talk about, so there might be long lapses of silence here while we relaxingly watch relaxing painting of gray on stone walls. We talk about the weather, that's always something. It's fairly safe if you're just talking about like the current weather and the weather yesterday and the weather tomorrow. And, you know, stay away from controversial things like the weather of the entire planet over the next century. I won't do that. When we first started painting these ages ago, ages and ages ago for our D and D, the very first set we did was red granite. It was scarlet red. It was pretty much like this you know, in terms of what the, the design of the piece. Not nearly as ambitious. We didn't paint the very basic. The bases actually were very separate pieces. And it was, well, that might not show on camera, but then we found out it did. So now all of the pieces are painted all the way to the very bottom. And they end up looking better. This is a really good acrylic paint. It doesn't smell very bad. The fumes aren't necessarily very poisonous. Uh, it doesn't show brush marks. You can do this kind of thing, overworked paint. Compared to some paints, you can't do that. So it's, we kind of like it. And it holds up pretty well. It's pretty sturdy. Okay, two out of nine. But who's counting, right?
Oh wait, there's like two thirds of a jar of this color left. I'm guessing by the time I'm done with all the balls in this set, this is going to be kind of scraping the bottom. Not a wall area. But this would be a lot of this set will be a lot of fun to play with. Um, you know, with the traps. And there's this really narrow and in gameplay 15, 20, 20 foot long corridor that's only 10 feet wide. So you can have two characters side by side, and that's about it. And the trap goes all the way across. The door on either end. They could, the, the DM could really uh, challenge the party just in that little part of it. I mean, if you got that far, if you got the door open, in order to even get into the corridor, getting through the corridor and open the door on the other side, you know, that's, that's going to be challenging. I wonder if our party is going to get challenged in one of these things. Yeah, even knowing, as we do, because we're building it, painting it that there are traps um, of course you know if you put up the regular walls the, the non trap walls you can't see which of the walls has a trap on it so you know, it's still a little challenge even if you know one is coming and in the narrow corridor you can't avoid the trap because uh, it's right there and you have you know, if you're gonna go through it, you're going through it. So let's see. Three, one third done. Corners. Thirty-three point three 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 infinitely three percent. Break and get a tissue soon. You know, we are outside almost the entire day yesterday because it was like the first nice day in two weeks. Nice being, you know, above 35 degrees without very much wind and more importantly, not raining, which it will be doing again later today. I mean, not opposed to rain, it's really good, plants grow, there reduces fire dangers, all sorts of good things about rain, uh, but when it seems like it never stops, like last fall too, it was saying it's like living in Ferenginar. Anyway, it finally stopped raining, we got two and a half yards of green topsoil. It's cubic yards. For those of you who have never encountered a cubic yard of any kind of dirt, it is a pile that is three by three by three. So we have two and a half of those, which is a lot of dirt. And we are using it to fill in the herb garden and another part of the landscaping we've done last fall. And it was wet because it had rained the day before that they delivered it. And I said, oh yeah, go ahead and deliver it, even though it rained, not, you know, because it had stopped raining, I didn't think there would be a problem because it was dry where we were dumping it. Not thinking that it had just been laying out in the rain and they were scooping it up. So it was really wet, which means that it weighed like one and a half times at least its normal weight if it were dry. So got a good workout moving that dirt to where it needed to be. It looks good now. And when the frost danger is over, which here in Michigan is not until May 15th, it's almost still what, almost four full weeks away, certainly three weeks away, we'll be able to plant stuff in it. And it is an herb garden, not like a flower garden or a vegetable garden. 
because we live in the woods. And what also lives in the woods are deer. Whoa, okay. Well, that held together. I'll fix that up a little later. <laughs> Good hands this morning. Um, and, you know, there are other things like raccoons and rabbits and stuff that also eat vegetables and things that you try to grow in a garden, but the deer are the worst. So what we discovered is that having an herb garden is a good thing because you can always use fresh herbs. You know, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, literally. Plus a lot of basil. Pesto and other things. And um, what else? I'm going to try to grow some peppers. Sometimes you can get away with those. Although we had one year, we were growing pretty, pretty hot Hungarian peppers. And uh, those got consumed. The great thing about deer is that you always know when your produce is at its peak of ripeness. Because it just sits there growing and growing and growing and you're looking at it and you say, wow, just a couple more days and this tomato will be perfect, or this peppers will be perfect, or things of that sort. And just when they are going to be perfect, that's when the deer eat them, because they know, they know too, better than we do about when things are at their best. Same thing's true of flowers. We discovered that they don't particularly like daffodils, so we've got those growing. But they love tulips, and the you know you watching a tulip and the bud is growing and it's just about ready to open, and just literally the day before the tulip would open, that's when the dewy is. Apparently, that's when flowers are the sweetest, is just as the bud is about to open. You are a pretty insidious that way. They were very hungry last winter. They ate a bunch of things out there that usually they don't eat. They usually don't like junipers because they're very prickly and strong tasting and not very nutritious, but they, they chewed up uh, the better part of half of two of our ground creeping junipers. So we'll be doing a lot of replanting as well as planting this spring. Replacing some of the things that were eaten and putting a whole lot of ground cover in where we had done the landscaping last fall. Okay, so this, this one marks number five. Number five meaning that we are more than half done with the corners. Did I miscount? Three, four, five. One, two, three, four. There's five left. There are ten of these. I thought there were only nine. Oh well. Well, now I'm not more than half done. I'm just half done. There are four up here and one on the floor. Getting the paint into all these little crevices between the stone blocks so that the wash can provide all sorts of variation on a uniform surface. 
Right. So if you want your wall to not look uniform, you start out by making it look uniform. That wonderful singing noise you hear behind me. Those are the 3D printers that print these. All of the blocks, the walls, the floors, the trap features, the flames, the doors, all of those things are printed ourselves. These are genuine made in Michigan pieces. Printers are working away like 24-7, just pumping out all sorts of little dungeon things. We got taverns, we got dungeon of doom like here. We got a ritual chamber that we finished last week that I'll show you if there's time at the end of this show. We've got some sort of evil king kind of palace thing that I forget exactly what we've called it. Um, it's got pillars and a throne and red carpets even, doors, arrow slits, it's really kind of a cool set. Uh, what else? Uh, oh yeah, a necromancer lair. The necromancer lair is really cool because it's got this pool of what looks like liquid in the middle of it. And that can be either like necromancy green or necromancy purple or necromancy blood. We've experimented with a couple of different kinds. I think that's actually one of our coolest features. It really looks good. But that's all put away somewhere in a bin because we did a couple of those. So you can't see that unless, uh, unless we pull it out later. We're actually thinking of maybe marketing some of these so that you who are watching have an opportunity to actually use in your campaigns uh, the same dungeon sets that we use. That would be kind of a cool thing to offer people. Because these are really very nice and they are all domestically made and hand painted as you can see. These are hands, actual hands in actual Michigan actually painting right in front of your very eyes. So no machine painted, no exploited for workers, just uh, hands. up here and one on the floor. This is number seven. And since there are ten of these instead of nine, the division to come up with a percentage completed is actually much simpler. So there. This would make 70%.
and whatever is printing back there is making very musical sounds today. I suppose it would even be possible to tell what's printing just by the sounds the printer is making. So if anyone gets really bored, you know, needs needs to develop a new skill, you could you could develop the skill of identifying uh, what's printing by the sound of the printer. Do a flip. <sighs> okay, let me finish this first. Let me, let me finish Miss that which is the 70% corner. Not not 70% of the entire set, but 70% of the corners. Let's set that down. Um, I'm going to flip a door. Uh, a door is a really good thing to flip because it looks exactly the same on either side. You can't really tell which way it goes. Here we go. You like? I'll do it again even. Watch. All sorts of spinny flippy. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to pick up the one I dropped. <sighs> didn't break see look at that so probably the better part of three feet onto a concrete floor and still held together which just shows the durability the wonderful durability of the dungeon tiles that we're producing here so what I'm gonna do what I'm doing here is I'm taking a real quick look at the corners that I painted to make sure I haven't missed anything it would be you know get all done put the gray paint away and then find out that you missed like one of the sides on the inside or the outside or one of the edges. And pull it back on again. Looks, looks like I have been thorough. That's pretty good. Seven out of seven. Let's see if we can continue the streak. So as I'm doing this, I'm totally disassembling the dungeon of doom that I showed you at the beginning of the show, and it probably will not be reassembled in its entirety again until everything is done, which means walls painted, floors painted, highlight blocks painted, the ground color and um, you know, black wash put on everything. In the meantime, it's just going to be a scattering of various and sundry tiles, most of which are corners. So when I'm done with the corners, which will be after two and a half more of these, I'm going to be off camera for just a little bit because I need to get some shoes because being outside all day yesterday, having a change in the weather, which means that allergens from some other part of the world have arrived. The nose is kind of drippy and it's getting a little bit uncomfortable. Too much information about my nose.
about whatever was printing, making all sorts of musical noise, it is now finished, I wonder what it was. This is, I guess this is more relaxing. You know, you know, one, one of those eggs took three hours to paint. <clears throat> There's metallic scales and just individual colored scales all over the place where so the edges had to be carefully demarcated and so on. A long time, but it turned out really pretty. Everybody likes it. The other one I did was just spiral stripes. And that was the fastest and easiest because all of the paints I used covered really well. Not all of them do. And the demarcation lines were really very easy to paint as it turned out. I wasn't sure it would found a way to do that. And then I did kind of a flame motif egg. And that took a while because orange, the yellow and the orange paints just don't cover. And they needed three colors. Yeah, three coats means almost, not quite, but almost three times as long as well. interesting how different parts of this go. Like this actually moves along very quickly. Just in terms of how much gets done and what amount of time. And painting the demarcation line between the wall and the floor, even though it's way less surface area, probably will take longer than it took than it will take to paint all of the walls. Because it's Fiddly, you have to be much more careful. Use a little brush with little bits of paint on it. So it's not to make a mess and then have to touch up back with the other color. Okay, do it. 
and then other things like painting the door frames. There's three doors. It can be kind of time consuming too because of it's all edges and detail work. A little brush, a little bit of paint. We always seem to finish the doors last. Probably because we're spending all of our time putting gray paint on the wall. So the three doors that are going along with this are actually going to have three colors on them. So they're small, and there's three colors, and it's a little be pretty time consuming because you have to kind of wait for the colors to dry between each event. There's four panels. And then we painted a scarlet red so that they can look all doomy. We approach it. It's got scarlet red panels with metal reinforcing bars and then black door frames to highlight the rest of it. So the walls and floors, base coats anyway, go pretty quickly. I'll probably get to the doors. will not be doing the black wash. I'm really not very good at getting the wash on very well. Nicole is very good at that. You no, know, you know, it might not be her favorite thing to do. It always turns out pretty well. Oh yeah, so painting all of this, and then I talked about using brown to highlight kind of random blocks, just to give it some variation. Yeah, that part takes longer than painting the walls themselves. You have to pick them out and then very carefully paint around the perimeter. You know, so you're not getting brown paint everywhere except where you on the block that you want. Make sure that the block you pick on this side is the same that you pick on that side. Someone's certain to notice if you getting the blocks wrong. You got a brown block, you want the block to be brown. Are just random <clears throat> so that ends up taking a while. Now I'm going to do uh, these. These are just walls. Plain old single walls. And there's four of them. These are pretty easy. Moving some things out of the way. And then then move on to uh, there's a quarter piece. Worse than the corners. It's got two walls on it, but they're really close together. So you'll see that when I'm done with this. And I have to figure out how to do the the trap walls because they're they're removable from the base. So I can't just do it like this. They're held on by magnets, but they're not held on well enough to put up brushing. <clears throat> so I'll find a way to hold them, or just a way to get the paint onto where it needs to go. Four of those. 
I put this glove on because I thought I'd get paint all over my hands and I'll get two tiny little specks. I expect though when I paint the trap walls because I'll have to be, I think I'll just have to be holding them. We usually do the tops at the very end because I want to make sure I get everything covered and if I forget the top, you well, know, it's pretty obvious. I missed the side, one of these side pieces, then, uh, you know, I could go on to another one and have an incompletely base coated wall. Step away just a minute and get some tissue.
This is the last of the four single wall trials. Done. Going to be doing this. This is a, a oh, flame from the magnet works, I guess. It's the uh, gas cloud. So, this is a corridor. It's only 10 feet wide. One character moves through at a time. Um, really good place to get stuck and have bad things happen. Get to detect traps, set it off in the next call. The, uh, actually, the next piece that I'll be doing after this uh, There's two of those. One is part of the corridor. So it's got one fixed and one trap. And then the other one is just a trap. I'll do the corridor first. Oh, this is kind of a pain. Getting the demarcation line there. And then we'll see how that goes. There's this big mortar line there. Actually, I can. Uh, no, but then there's a partial stone there. I didn't see until I painted it. Okay, well, maybe I'll do that one first because it's going to be the most challenging of all of them. We'll see how quickly this dries after I get it done. And it makes a difference too. Okay, I'll paint the other inside wall. And you can see there's a stone block there. And then just at the base of these little bits of the edges of oh, stone blocks. It's hard to see on the camera. See them there. Floor blocks. So those will have to be very carefully painted with the floor color. So a narrow corridor like this is not only challenging for the adventurers into the Dungeon of Doom, but also for the person who paints it, that it looks doomy and not crappy before they venture into it.
I'm painting the highlight block. And this is going to be a little challenging too, getting the brush in there and marking off one like that one without getting paint everywhere. Yeah, this one particular tile, whole set, probably be taking as much time as maybe five of just because the narrow clearances. Make sure not to have too terribly many sets, narrow quarters. Okay, so we'll set that aside. Now we've got this one. This is, it looks like the other one. You can see it moving a little bit. But this is the trap wall, which comes off and on. Take that off, which makes this just like a regular wall, which makes it easy. You're going to have to paint the floor. Well, that's going to have to be painted the whole color, I guess. So, just to show the gap. So, I'll get to that in just a minute. Definitely have to be painted the whole color on the other side because the blocks line up. There. It's important that that be done that way. And I think what I'll do is I don't want to paint too much on where the magnets are or where the post is because that could mess up the fit. I'm going to paint around them. I don't want don't want stuff getting in the way of things holding together. Line here, and then when I come back with the other color with the fine brush, it'll paint this demarcation line. But this, this edge around here, I'll make sure that there's consistency on camera. And for the players who are playing with this. off and on on this side, not the same one. And that messy line, these messy lines here, like on all of them, will get painted over with the demarcation line I'll be putting on later with the floor color. just like it, um, except that it's just got a single wall. All I need to do on this one is paint around the base. That is where the block, all block. 
and you want these and actually you know the printing is and the design work is really good on these the blocks actually line up perfectly If you're just looking at the set really from the outside uh, with the wall on it you'd never know that it was a special tricky wall so again I'm going to just paint around the edges here not painting over the magnets and the posts because we want the fit to still be fitting but we also don't want we want the color to be consistent. So we'll just do this. And then sloppily along this demarcation line because that will be painted much more carefully with a smaller brush with a smaller color. And okay, so this will set it over here. Um, what we have now are some inside corners. There's two inside corners. Inside corners have much less wall area than outside corner. Basically just this little post where everything comes together. Painting four edges. down on the base. Okay, those are the two inside corners. Now what we have are three uh, doorways. <clears throat> it's hard to see with it's just all primed, but there's a frame for the door here, and then blocks on the outside. What <clears throat> we usually do is we paint the blocks and, and get the paint onto the door frame, because the door frame gets painted a different color later, and that'll paint over it. And it's a lot easier getting the line straight painting up to that edge than it is the other way. So it's like basically like two inside corners. So again, not having to be terribly careful there. In fact, it helps to not be terribly careful. Because uh, with the black primer, you can hardly see where the edges are. But with this gray paint, you can see the edge of the uh, door frame a lot more clearly. So that when I paint the door frame, it's actually easier to do if there's gray paint slopped onto it.
this castle door frame. You can kind of see where the frame is going to be there. <coughs> Sorry, there. Another one. already did a flip. Did you miss the flip? It's going to take a while to get all the paint out of this brush. I'm really near the end, so I don't feel like cleaning it just for a couple of balls at the end, but it's getting pretty caked up. You just feel the brush is getting stiff. But I've only got one door frame and four trap walls to do. So. We will just live through this and then give it a thorough soaking and cleaning before I end up using it uh, a little bit later to paint the floors. Okay. There's two door frames. There's the third one.
Okay, so now what I've got left are the trap tiles, the wall tiles, the traps. There are two plain walls on either side. When those are in place, you can't tell there's a trap there. And then there are two of these with the trap plate on them. And there's no base for holding on. So what I'm going to end up doing is I'm just going to hold them on the corners here and paint them all around. And then set them on a piece of paper and carefully hold one little corner and do all of that. And then touch the wet paint there and then touch up and get those done. So I need to get a piece of paper that I can put on the workbench here that those can set up. And I don't know where that is. I'm going to wander around and look for it here. I'll be back in a minute. I don't want to use a paper towel for this. Oh, look. There's one, for some reason, there's sitting up there. Why? I don't need a whole sheet. There's room for a whole sheet. You say half a sheet. Okay, now let's see how this works. I'm going to start with one of the not traps tiles. Hold it up here and paint around my fingers. Really nothing to grip onto on the bottom. So yeah, it just has to be done this way. Fortunately, this paint is very forgiving. And so if you kind of like touch it, it it doesn't all lift off or anything like that. You don't end up just with the you know gaps or spots. But this is where the, the glove certainly comes in handy because I will be getting paint on it. Okay, I'll well, we'll just hold it like this. Look around to the sides, make sure I've got all of that covered. I'm going to just set it down, hold it in the middle, and paint these edges that I didn't get because that's where my glove was. There's just one little corner there. And because of the rough texture and the way the paint holds up, and it comes out okay. So, and then I can move the paper around to make sure that I've got One down, three to go. I'll do the same thing here. So I'll paint the back first. That's where it's a little bit harder to paint it this way. Of course, since it's symmetric, this could be the front as easily. I'll just say, a uncomfortable way of holding it. Thank you. 
Okay. I'm going to go through the same technique here. I'm trying not to knock over the other one. Getting the corners, holding it. These edges first. I decided what I'm going to do is this plate here with a hole in it. That's where the flame where the gas shoots out. That's going to be painted brass. And the hole in the inside of it will probably be highlighted with a little black wash. Or green wash. You know, black wash for the fire. Green wash for the gas maybe. Um, but I'm going to paint the whole thing gray right now. I'm going to do that for two reasons. One is so that the edges are uniform, uh, but also I can see it when I paint the brass. And there won't be any gaps in the color. It'll be uniform, but uh, that will stand out. It'll be very bright, and you won't be able to miss it. Even though, since it's a trap, you wish you could miss it, no, you won't be able to. I'm going to put this here, paint these corners where I was holding it, like I did with the others. I got one more of these left. Do that now. The same thing here is uh, paint right over the trap. Gray. I can 
see it clearly when I paint the brass on later. Okay, this is coming along pretty well. is actually the end of the gray that I need to do but before I put the gray away I'm going to inspect these guys. Yep, good thing I did just like there's a little spot there that didn't get covered. at all of the rest of them to make sure that they are uh, that all the surfaces got gray paint on them they almost almost do and um, what I'm gonna do next is paint which really needs a thorough cleaning so I'm gonna let this soak a little bit 1130 a little early for a break I'm going to do a couple of other little things first. Get a couple. I'm going to paint the panels on the doors red. Those have to be painted and dried before anything else really can be done with them. Doors have uh, little holes. No, we can't see them, but there's a hole on the top and the bottom that is designed for the hinge pin. And oftentimes, what I can do is get a toothpick into them like that, which provides a way to, it's not really working here, provides a way to hold it. But since I'm only painting the panels, I can use these handy little alligator cliffs and grab a corner. So what I'm going to be doing is using a smaller brush and some scarlet red paint. Scarlet red is much more doomy than the bright red. I'm going to be painting all these panels. And I'm going to make sure that I get paint all the way around into the edges. Because then when I paint the metal bars over them, uh, it will make for a much cleaner edge. Usually what we've been doing is painting the bars and the frame the same color, but I'm going to do something different. I'm going to paint the panels red, the bars kind of a dark silvery metal and then the frame will be black like the um, door frames that I'll be painting later. So I can grab on like this. I've got three of them. I've got enough clips. I've got the red. The red is uh, the Aho color which doesn't come in a jar. It comes in these little squeeze bottles. So I'm going to have to squeeze some into this cup and use that. The doors are the same on both sides. I have to make sure I get the panels on both sides. When I'm done with that, I'm going to take a break. And then when I come back, I will be painting the demarcation lines around the bases here. So that with a small brush, so that that's a nice clean line between the wall and the floor. 
And after I'm done with those, I'll be getting the big brush out again and painting the rest of the floor the teal blue color that will be the final color. I'll get myself a couple drops of this red paint. That should be enough. We'll see. Always squeeze more out. And we'll start with panels on these doors. And everything is filled up all my workspace. When this goes on, it looks really bright, but it dries to really um, kind of interesting darker red much less bright there's more gray in it now in order to make sure that I'm getting it into all of these edges I'm going to intentionally paint up onto the surface of the bars so that way I know that I've got it covered Otherwise, I'll end up with gaps that'll be obvious because they'll be black instead of either red or metallic. to see. It's dark, so I'm going to take my glasses off. I see much better close up without the glasses. Yeah, I can see. Especially when you're looking down at it, which you will be if you're playing with it. But I especially want to make sure that I'm getting the red down into there so that it doesn't show a gap later. And this is where see, it dries really quickly. You can see the difference between where it dried and how it really tones down, becomes flatter and a little darker in keeping with the Doom theme of the Dungeon of Doom. It's a little bit streaky. I think I like that. It makes it look like it's maybe a little worn. I think the panels are, have been there a while and they're a little worn out. Having painted these doors before many times, I discovered that Getting it all in the corners of these, the recess panel is really pretty important to how it looks later. Yep, so you can see here how the color is. And you can imagine these being a dark metallic color and the door frame staying black. That should be uh, doomy. Want as much doominess as we can. We've not, you know, we've not built in any overhead lighting or uh, 
even wall sconces on the walls, so the, the dungeon will probably be poorly lit, if lit at all. People of the next adventurers will have forgotten to bring torches. Only one of them will have dark vision. And that player will be a jerk and not tell anybody about what they're seeing. That's what happens in some of these campaigns, so... magic user will forget to use tech traps because they're too busy arguing about the light and the lack of light and how nobody's cooperating. One of the players might even, you know, get so upset that they just walk out all together. They sit on the outside and just have a snack while everybody else is in there getting gassed and flamed by the trap. Ignoring their screams of agony and pleas for help. That party will hold together really well. They probably, they probably have a party name to probably something really impressive like Saltworthy. Actually, kind of like that this paint is going on a little thin, and that it it shows some of the dark underneath it. That it's a variation. So after half the party is dead, one of them is just outside eating pretzels or fritters or something not caring about what happened to their uh, their compatriots in the Saltworthy clan. They'll run into the final boss, and the final boss will be like this gnome, tiny little gnome guy, whose basic weapon I've never seen this used effectively, right? Kasha's hideous laughter, maybe. A terrible, a terrible, terrible joke. Like, why did the chicken cross the road? Because the walk sign finally came on. And they'll all fail their check. Saving throw, and they'll fall on the floor, laughing, all of them, and the gnome will just come up and, I don't know, if he's an evil gnome, he'll just like stab them in the heart or something while they're laughing. If he's more of like a stand-up comic sort of thing, he'll just uh, leave, leave the room and lock the door behind them, and when they finally break out of their hideous laughter, they'll uh, try to have to figure out how to open a locked door. Okay, so I've got the panels on this door red. I got almost all the, got the inside edges both sides, top and bottom. That little corner there. Pick that over here. Grab another alligator clip. Flip another door. And paint these panels too. Notice how less quickly this goes than just painting walls. All we 
good thing that is. I just tried it, but I did this now. There's a lot of paints drying, you know, the big brushes soaking. You know, these doors always turn out to be a little surprising. You'd think that, you know, the part that you're just sort of slopping paint around on to get a base coat on the panels would be the fast part. But actually, painting these uh, metallic grids goes way faster than when painting these panels. Getting the paint into all the little corners takes a little time. Okay, three out of six door sides done. Some chat going on, sorry, I was busy painting these and I can't see from here. Uh, hi. Hi, welcome. No, um, the rust underlayer, what I'm doing right now. Well, we painted these walls, 
So just to explain what's going on, this is a whole dungeon set. Okay, these are all walls to the dungeon set. Uh, I painted those a base gray layer, and uh, I'll be painting the floors a kind of a really, really dark blue, and then we'll put a black wash over the whole thing. These are doors. And no, it's not really rust. What I'm doing is uh, the panels actually are going to stay red. So I'm going to be uh, dark red, kind of bloody red panels. Uh, then I'm going to use a uh, like a duraluminum or something metallic color. It's a dark silver. Paint the grids. And then the door frame itself will be black, which will match the frame. But thanks for stopping in. Sorry I missed uh, you coming on in your initial question because, uh, yeah, I was just sort of, you know, painting these edges. And with trifocals, I had to take my glasses off to see, see clearly up close, and I couldn't see your chat right away. But thanks for joining in. So yeah, this is going to be a red door, red paneled door with a metallic cross bracing and a black door frame for what we're calling a Dungeon of Doom. The Dungeon of Doom is pretty cool because it actually has trap walls in it. Let me just finish this panel and I'll show you a trap wall. Okay, I'll set this aside. What's really kind of cool about this set is that um, you get a floor like this and it's got a peg and some magnets on it. And you can take a wall, a plain old wall, and put it on there. And it looks just like an ordinary wall, like this. But when you walk past it, and trigger the trap because you did not cast detect traps. The DM takes that off and puts this on. And this has a panel with a hole in it and out of there shoots a flame or a gas cloud or some other kind of trap. So you can modify the dungeon as you walk through it and trigger traps where no one would see one unless they had actually you know, successfully detected the trap ahead of time. And in this particular set, there are two of those walls, one of which is just like inside the door. When you first walk in, that one's fairly easy to escape if you're at all clever about it. But the other one is in a very narrow corridor, which is very hard to escape. And it's when you move past it. So, um, let me grab another alligator clip, and I'm going to paint the panels on this door, and then uh, I've been going on, a, actually when I'm done with this, a little more than two hours, so I'm going to take a quick break and clean brushes, and when I get back from the break, and the brushes are clean. I'm going to start working on the floors of the dungeon tiles. This is kind of an interesting red. It goes on really bright, which is not a good color for what we're doing. But when it dries, it darkens quite a lot and gets flat. So it looks menacing. And these doors are supposed to not be inviting. But the idea of underlayers, yeah, we've done that. Um, underlayers of colors and then oftentimes using a wash uh, over that. Give it some texture and color. Sometimes dry brushing, we've done that. Um, sometimes what we've done is using a metallic undercolor and then a color, thin color over. You can a lot of variation in the metallic colors. This is a, just a little simpler. Let's 
these are designed for D&D uh, &D play. We want them to look good enough for that, but they're not, they're not really designed to be like display pieces. They're designed to be used in play. A lot of it is interchangeable. So if you're still on, once I finish these panels, I can show you kind of how the uh, tiles work, because they're really pretty cool. to the side here. Each of these panels, these tiles, has have magnets in the base. You can actually see them They're sticking out there metallic. And they uh, let you connect them so they don't fall apart while you're doing gameplay. And you can rearrange them in many, many different configurations. In fact, we've even had one campaign where the DM uh, basically took the, took the dungeon apart and reconfigured it twice while we were in combat. That was a kind of a cool demonstration of how versatile these things are. And we print all of these on 3D printers behind me. They're all made, custom made, and then hand painted like this. Three doors in this set. The doors are pretty cool too. They, uh, they have little holes in them. I can't see it because it's black on black. There's a tiny little hole here. And hinge pins go through the door into the base and into a lintel that gets glued or epoxied across the top here so that the doors operate. So if it's locked, you know, your party just sits there and waits for somebody to pick the lock or break the door down and then the door opens and you can go through it. But, you know, that just add to the fun of your D&D &D campaign. these sets are made to be used and we've used many of them in our show. We've had rough stone cut dungeons, we've had warehouses, we've had taverns, we've had manor houses, There's lots of variations, wooden floors, plastered walls, rough cut stone, Fine cut stone. We even have uh, houses that we've made and tents, campfires, all sorts of things that we've been able to print and paint and use in our campaign. Just checking to make sure that I've got the bottoms of these panels painted.
So, let's pick up uh, a fair amount of time, but the doors are more than half done now. So what I'm going to be doing, thanks for joining in, but I'm going to be taking about a 10 minute break to clean brushes and then I'll come back and paint floors. So if you stayed with us, you can take a little break too. Be back soon. And we'll be working on the next stage of the painting of this particular dungeon. Usually there's two of us doing the show, but daughter, who often is star of the show, is taking a break this week, so I'm doing this solo, which means that I am missing chat. Apologize for having done that. Okay, well, let's hope that this brush holds up. Get this out of the way, Get a little water in here. Paint doesn't dry too much. Oh. Side, and I will be back in about ten minutes.
Okay, and I got myself a little bit of a breakfast lunch thing here. Um, so, what I'm going to be doing next is... I'll just show it on this piece because that's a lot easier. Is the floor base color. The floor base color is going to be kind of a very, very dark blue color that when black washed looks like really good stone. And the wall comes down and there's this boundary here between the stone floor and the stone wall. I want to be able to use a big brush to do the stone floor because there's just a lot of surface area to cover. But I need to do this boundary because the big brush just makes a mess. So I'll be using a little brush, little bitty strokes, paint around the boundary, down the edge here into the base for all of these tiles. Uh, there's just, there's a lot of edges. There's 10 corners that need to be this way and that way. Um, four walls, four frames. Yeah, so this will take a while. The only good thing is that I've got these trap tiles and there's no floor on them. So I can set those aside. And not have to worry about painting them. Okay. So that's that. I don't need this right now. Um, what I'm going to do first is the most difficult one. This is a narrow passageway. And I need to get the brush in there. And very carefully on both sides, paint that tiny little bit of stone floor that's along the edge of the base there and probably down into the crease. So I'll do this one and then the corners, door frames and so on. Then I'll paint the base floor color in. And then we'll see how much time is left. Whether I can get more done, I might work on the doors, work on the door frames. Doors go in here. Frames will be painted black. Uh, but we'll see. So let me find the blue. This is the, the Tamiya blue. And we'll start with the most difficult one and work our way through to ones that are a little bit easier. Oh, one of our cats came down to say hello. glasses so I can see my work. Ooh. This one's almost gone. And it's not going to be enough to finish all of this, I think. But we'll see. Let's see how far we can get with it.
Let me get the sides. This is even the sides are a little challenging here. And paint the demarcation line between the floors and the wall, which is almost even. Do it on the other side and then paint that one, the other wall, which is a little bit even more difficult than this side. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a really nice uh, gray color paint. You know, the light doesn't really go down into it. Okay, now look at the tiny little bits of stone floor on the other side. This is a really well-designed print in terms of its visual feel, but not in terms of its friendliness to the painter. Of course, the adventurers who are coming through here would never notice the fine line between the wall and the floor because they'll be too busy being gassed or burned by the traps that are in the corridor. Those things have a tendency to take precedence over the aesthetics of their environment. painting enough of this stone floor with a small brush so that I can get the big brush in there later without uh, getting it all over the walls. Okay. Well, that came out pretty well. There's a spot there. We're right on the edge. Which was easy to get to, yay. Okay, so I think I've got that. Now I'm going to do corners. I've got uh, these. Ten of these corners. There's like two walls in each one. They're not too terribly hard to reach. A very little corner bit. So it's just basically painting along the base and pushing the paint up to the right on the demarcation line there. Um, all along both sides. Yeah, I mean, it's much easier to reach this way. 
and then getting it in you know, far enough away from the wall, especially here in the very corner, so that when I use the larger brush to paint in the floors, it doesn't get all over the wall. I like to avoid going back and forth with colors as much as possible. Hi, Sat. You just come to say hello? Yeah, say hi to everybody. to the side a little bit. You can see what's going on a little better. There we go. And it gives better light too. These cameras have little ring lights on them, which light up the work pretty well. So, two, one, two birds with one stone. That's one corner, and you can see the contrast in color between the stone wall and the floor. And again, that floor looks kind of blue, but once it's washed with a black wash, it really ends up looking very nice. Side, and we'll celebrate the completion of that corner with a toast.
So, yeah. And I continue to paint these demarcation lines. It's going along, you know, relatively well. This isn't really a difficult thing to do. It's just a matter of being a little careful to not slap the paint up onto the wall. Let's just push the color up to the base of the wall. And then with this you know, demarcation line with this painted, I can use a larger brush to paint in the surface area of the floor, which would, you know, make it go a lot faster. But the larger brush just carries, it's just too big and it carries too much paint. And it gets up onto the wall high enough that it leaves streaks that are pretty noticeable. So this takes a little bit longer, but it makes for a much better finished product. There are, I've got three, this is the fourth out of ten corner pieces. And that is actually the majority of this particular set that I'm working on. There are a lot of corners. And I've got some straight walls, just plain one-sided walls, uh, some door frames, some inside corners. You know, a little bit fiddly, but these corner pieces take come sort of the longest. There's not much floor surface area, but there's a lot of edge surface area. paint all the way down to the bottom of the base even though sometimes the bases are covered up because the tiles go together like this if there's something on the outside you know you want it to look uniform and not just scabby okay so that's uh four corners this will be the fifth corner yeah that'll be half of the corners okay dividing Actions and percentages. Basic arithmetic tutoring while the show is going on here. Again, we're just painting in the boundary line between the floor, which are a darker grayish blue color, and the walls, which are a lighter gray. And when those are done, we'll get out a bigger brush and paint the rest of the floor surface. And when the floors are done, 
I'll be doing some of the detail work. I think, you know, when I paint the floors, I haven't done the demarcation line yet, but we have these door frames. Um, I'm going to paint the floors on these door frames first so that they dry, and then I can paint the frames. I'm going to be doing those a black color, charcoal black. And when I do those, I'll also paint the lintels, which glue across the top. You can't see those right now because they're way off camera. But they're just little pieces that go across the top and seal the door in. And the door is actually hinged, so it's a, a working door. These pieces are kind of cool. Not only can you configure them in many different ways, but uh, the pieces work. It always seems counterintuitive to me that when you're painting things like this, even fine detail, that it always works better if you have a fairly large amount of paint on the brush than if you have just tiny little bits. So my tendency, you know, kind of intuition about it all is that if you're doing detail work, you want hardly any paint on the brush so you don't get it slopped all over, but then it doesn't come off the brush and you just keep working and working. But if the brush is fairly full of paint, then you can control where it goes pretty well. I mean, everybody who's done painting has learned that, but it, I don't know, it's just, it just seems counterintuitive to me. But that's what it, that's how it works well. And this is these paints are really easy to work with. They don't leave brush marks, and especially on rough surfaces like this. You just, you just never have a problem with that at all. You can paint over them, different colors, wash them, highlight them, do a second coat. They dry quickly so that you can get back to, uh, you know, another color or a boundary or a second coat or highlights or something really pretty quickly but they don't dry so fast that, you know, your brush gets totally gummed up. And that's why we use them, because they're easy to use. And they have a lot of really good colors. Most of the grays and browns also have really good coverage. And that's what we use mostly because, you know, we're doing stone and wood a lot. And so it's, it's good to have good coverage. Some of the, the brighter colors like oranges and yellows oftentimes need two, sometimes even three coats. At least when you're brushing it on to get a really good even color. But there aren't too many of those colors in dungeons. I mean, there are in detail things like a flag or a flame or something of that sort, but most dungeon tiles are not bright yellow. Most floors are not bright orange. I mean, they could be, but that's, that's not how people think of dungeons or warehouses or taverns. Although the taverns we've done, the tavern sets we've done with... Um, Green and blue, I mean, not together. We've done a green set and a blue set. They have like stucco walls with timber framing, that kind of wall. And the stucco part we've done 
in both a dark blue in one case and a really nice deep green in another, and that turned out pretty well. Looks good on a tavern. No, nope, nothing's already done. Okay, you can tell it's done because of the color of the paint on it. Well, the beeping and singing that you hear in the background are our 3D printers. All of these pieces we actually print ourselves on the 3D printers. If they need some assembly, we assemble them ourselves, and then, as you can see, we paint them. Uh, but the 3D printer is printing away back there, making yet more pieces or more dungeon tile sets. We created a bunch of these. We have a tavern, you know, with a dark nook in it so that the mysterious stranger can sit in the shadow and observe what's going on without being seen clearly. We've got, uh, this is the Dungeon of Doom, because it's very dark. It's got some traps in it, doors that are locked that can get you stuck in a dangerous situation narrow corridors. We have a ritual chamber, which is really pretty cool. It's got uh, elemental sigils on the wall. And in the center there's a brazier that has a detachable flame so that the DM can either have it on or off depending on what magic is going on. There's a necromancer's lair with a pool full of whatever kind of disgusting slime the necromancer is working with. Blood or ooze. The green ooze is one that looks really good. Got a throne room with a big throne, a raised dais, and actually a red carpet. You know, you have to have a red carpet leading up to the throne. We recently discovered how to make carpets. Uh, really cool accent pieces in a dungeon. This one is the Dungeon of Doom, and it's getting painted doomy colors. <sighs> I'm just spreading this stuff all over the place. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten corners. So, got the corners done. I'm gonna do, there are four. Four straight walls here. I'm gonna do those next. Just sort of keep track of what I'm getting done. The simple walls, not corners. He's just go on the side of uh, the room.
I'm just using this smaller brush to paint the boundary between the floor color and the wall color. And I'll use a larger brush to paint the floors, stones themselves. And that will go much more quickly, but you can't use the big ones to do the boundary. It just makes too much of a mess. And you paint down the sides all the way to the base of the tile. Oftentimes these edges don't show because they're up against another tile, but sometimes they do, especially in the back here. And you don't want, you know, the bases to, you know, the, the black primer to be showing. And, and it just, you know, especially if the boundary edge isn't really clear. So we just paint it right down to the bottom. And that's three of the walls. This is the last of the regular walls. really didn't see the purple glove here. That was for when I was painting the walls. Not really getting paint on myself here this time. So, but I just kept it on anyway. So what I'm going to paint next, this is a special thing. As you can see, there's a peg here. 
and an outline of the ball. And what goes here is uh, a regular wall. Is there's magnets in here and on the base. You see the little shiny magnets. Goes on there. And it looks like, oh, that's just the wall, right? And then you're walking along, not using Detect Magic because, you know, it's just a dark, narrow corridor and what could possibly go wrong. And uh, all of a sudden, you trigger a trap. And what you can do, because these come off, is that wall comes off and this wall goes on. And right there, you've got a panel with a hole in it. And out of that will shoot a flame or a gas cloud. We actually have those. It isn't painted yet. That's the flame. And the flame shoots out of the hole in the wall, trapping you in the corridor. Black on black. You can't really see it too well. There you go. You can see the flame coming out of the wall. And, you know, it's like at head height, so. Your hair and, and beard get, get pretty well singed uh, by that. So I'll be painting this panel like grass so that it really shows when the trap is triggered. And of course the flame will be painted all sorts of yellow, orange, and red flaming colors. And the alternative is there's a gas cloud. Looks like that, and that'll be painted Oh, you know, vile green and a little white and maybe a touch of blue. Touch of yellow. It'll just look gross. You don't want to walk in it. So those are what come out of the trap. So this on one side is just a regular wall. That'll be easy. On the other side, there is the demarcation of where the floor is and where the wall is. I haven't painted one of those yet. We've done one of these before. And I'll see how that goes. It shouldn't be too hard. There's a little bit of a raised edge there. So the line of demarcation should be pretty clear if I'm careful. And there's two of these. One has a wall on this side, and the other one is just the trap wall. That's for a larger room. printer has changed tone. I'm tempted to look back and see what it's doing. And it was chirping away, but now it's just kind of... Maybe it's, maybe it's doing uh, like a bigger area or something. It's doing cross hatching. It must be making a base or something. Okay. see how this goes. You know, that raised edge makes finding the line pretty straightforward. But I want the lighter gray there. So what when the trap wall is up against it. like a regular wall. Uh, traps are supposed to be like that. You know, I guess it's, you know, like if there were just a gas cloud spewing out, it wouldn't really be a trap then, would it? So there, that worked okay. There. 
and on this side. Mm, getting close to being done with these demarcation lines. I've got one more trap wall, and a couple of inside corners, and three door frames. Once those are done, I'll get the big brush out and start painting floor tiles, floor stones, all of that. There isn't too much of it in this dungeon, almost all corners, and so there isn't that much in terms of floor space. So that part should actually go fairly quickly, and it looks like there's enough paint actually to get it done with this jar of field blue. Which turns out to be a handy and good thing. Okay, so we got those done. I've got one, two of these inside corners. I'll do those next. Put that away. And I'll do the door frames. I'm actually going to paint the floor tiles, floor stones on the door frames first. Because I want those to dry so that I can do the frames themselves a little bit later. Those are going to be painted black. A nice flat charcoal gray black color that will look really good on those and will frame the doors nicely. And it'll be dark enough to stand out against the stone. At least that's the intent. So we'll paint these guys. Not much edge on the top, but you know, they've got. Two sides on the sides. Get those in. near the bottom of the jar. Can't always tell how deep the brush is getting into the paint. Now. Which will be less of an issue with the big brush because we just want a lot of paint slopping around on the big brush. But for this I don't want too much so be a little careful. And now I've got these door frames. There's three of them. And when I paint the floors, I'm actually going to bring these out. There's just two plain floor tiles. That's all there are in this whole dungeon. There's two of these things where there isn't any wall attached. 
kind of close quarters. So if you got a big party, <clears throat> and it'll be a little bit cramped, but if you get like four, four characters in your party, maybe even five, you know, when you're in the hallway, you'll have to go single file through it, and some of them will be outside the door and not able to help, and some will be trapped in the hallway needing help. This should be, this should be pretty uh, nice for a DM to make a, a very difficult uh, encounter for your characters. But, yeah, the, the rooms are small, the hallway is small. Traps are large. It should be a very popular place for parties to uh, blame each, party members to blame each other for everything that's going wrong because things will go wrong without a doubt. Line here. Theoretically, at least the floor will, the door lintel will go all the way down. The bottom here, the door frame, but it, we tried that once and it just doesn't look good. So we're painting this this area back here with just the floor color. And actually, I'm going to use a small brush and do the whole thing. Because it's just the kind of spot that when I'm doing the big brush on the floor, I want to forget to turn it around. And then it won't be painted. So this way it'll be done. And all you have to worry about the stones. And yeah, I really don't need to be careful right there because that'll be painted black. Go down to it. Might have to come back and touch it up a little bit later, but we'll see. This is where the stone meets the stone. Yes, I'm going to leave these door frames right up in front here. Because I'm going to be painting the floors on these first so that I can get the door frames painted down. Maybe yet even today. We'll see how how fast the floor painting goes. And then after the floors are painted, it's a kind of tedious but important step, which is to paint the highlights on the blocks, the, the walls. So as you can see, they're all uniform gray right now. And it's really nice to, like, have anywhere from like maybe two to four blocks on each wall painted a contrasting color just so there's some variation. I think people come to expect that. So we got a nice kind of dark brown color, darker than we usually use for those highlights um, that we'll be using to highlight those blocks. And that'll take a while because there's a lot of walls and we need to pick out the stones and then paint carefully around the stones so you don't slop up onto other stones. You know, that kind of thing. And then make sure that you get the same stones on the front and the back. Because it's the stone that's just a separate, a different color. The entire stone. And these are stones on the front. Anyway, when we get to that, no, I'm not sure if we'll have time for that today or not. We've got a little more than an hour left. So I'll definitely get the floors done. And then uh, maybe I'll do a... After that, I'm going to do a little bit of work on the doors. Because part of the door is painted black. And I, well, 
I have the black paint out for the door frames. I don't want to put the frames on the walls. The outside edges of the door as well, so they painted that color. So I will want them to be ready for that. So I'll paint these floors. And then I'm going to paint the metal lattice on the doors. And after I do that, I will paint the door frames on the doors and the walls black. And then if there's time left, or if I decide to go longer today, we'll see. I'll start at least start painting highlight uh, blocks on the walls with the brown color. Okay, just two of those. And I, even though I'm painting the demarcation line last on these door frames, I can still do the floors first, even though the paint's wet because it's the same color. Ta -da! I'll just be painting the same color on top of the same color and I don't need to worry about whether it's dried yet or not. Oh, someone joined in. <laughs> Welcome. Sorry, I uh, my eyes are not too terribly good. I wear trifocals, and I am nearsighted, so I can see up close. Most people my age can't see up close, which is unfortunate. I can, but I can't see far away. I'm looking up at the screen and what I see is there's a line with what might be letters. Okay, but I needed to get up close there to, uh, to see what you were doing and to say hi. And thanks for joining in. What I'm doing here is painting dungeon tiles for our Dungeons and Dragons show. They're all printed on the 3D printers behind us. Everything is made from scratch, custom made, hand painted, and featured on our D&D &D show, which is on Twitch on Sundays at 2. And what I'm doing right now is a Dungeon of Doom, which features small dark rooms, narrow corridors, traps and evil doomy looking features like red doors and things like that so i finished painting the base coat on the walls this gray color i'm making the clearing up the demarcation line between the walls and the floors this is actually the very last one see it on like this wall. Just the demarcation line with a small brush and I'm gonna get out my big brush and paint in all the floor tiles and that'll be the base coat on that. They will all get a black wash later which will make them you know it'll bring out the features in the floors and the walls. So after I'm done with the floors I'm gonna work on the doors a little bit. There's some sort of detail work to be done. There's three doors in this set. With red panels, metallic iron grid work. The panels, this grid work will be a dark metallic color. And then the frame itself will be black, as will the door frame into which they fit. And they're actually working doors. They're hinged and they open and close. Okay, well, what I've 
think I've done. I'm going to look quickly at all of these tiles to make sure I've got the demarcation lines done. The boundary lines. And I do, so now I can get out a large brush and start painting the floor tiles themselves. And thanks for joining in. So a little brush, bigger brush, soft bristles. I'm going to, I did these floor tiles um, last in terms of the boundary line, but I'm going to actually paint them first so that the paint dries and I can paint the door frames black a little bit later. So just dipping in here, get in between, black wash will go in between the floor stones later. Oh. I promised that I would paint the backs of these with a small brush so I wouldn't forget it. And then I forgot it. Nicely done. I did get that one I got that one. So I'll triple check them before I finish. So I'm just going around, all around uh, the tiles. These have kind of a lot of surface texture. They're going to take, take the, a fair amount of paint to get coverage. And I want to be able to get in between here, uh, let the black wash do the variation rather than the whether I get it painted or not. So I'll try to make them look pretty uniform as a base for the variation that we'll put on later. I'll just show you this. This is uh, an example of the really nice narrow hallway that we are putting into this set. Um, this is where everybody's going to get trapped between two doors. It's only one block wide. There's like five feet, I guess. <clears throat> and uh, two blocks long, so you can get maybe three people crowded in here. There's a trap, so only one of the three will die a horrible, flamey death. Um, and the other two will stand behind the locked door and then scream for help while their other party members, uh, I don't know, probably play a card game or something rather than help out. And if they finally get through the last door, then they'll meet the boss, whoever is left of them in whatever health situation there are. And, uh, and, you know, the honest are like that. They just make life hell for the players. <clears throat> okay, so I'll just set that up aside. There's a lot of tiles here, so I'm just trying to make room for them. They don't bump into each other too terribly much. And since these are floor tiles and I'm painting the sides, I don't want them to attach to each other. They're magnetic. So that when you put the dungeon together, it holds together, even if you move it a little bit or bump the table. Uh, but that also means that if I'm painting this edge and then I'm painting this edge and the edges get together, it'll stick. And then uh, the paint will dry and they'll be gummed up and pull the paint off and it'll have to be redone and so the old ounce of prevention thing is prevailing today we'll see how I do at that and there's not just surface area but there's a lot of uh, texture actually on the stone floor which doesn't show in the primer very well. 
and there actually doesn't shows a little better with the flat paint but when the uh, the black wash is put on it that brings out the texture pretty well and the, the floors look pretty cool then so again I'm doing these door frame floors first here and here so that I can come back and paint flat black on those on the frames so two out of three of those done between so different painters have different techniques some painters will paint a base color in and then do like a dry brush get the textures and the variation because these are there's so many of these and we want them to hold up pretty well the preference for using washes to putting a base coat in you know which is kind of flat and uniform and then using a, a brown wash or in this case it's going to be a black wash to give to bring out the like the grains and the texture on the stone and things of that sort and it gives it a pretty good look and it's also fairly easy and quick. And when you're painting like uh, 10, 14, 16, there's like at least 20 tiles in this set. It isn't our largest one. The largest one has over 30. When you're painting that many of them, and you want to be able to have them available like tomorrow, Sometimes doing something that both looks good and is fast is the thing to do. So that's kind of what we're doing here. So those are the door frames. Let's see. Continuing to make some room. I don't want to get paint on everything, so I'm not going to paint. When I paint these, I'm going to get the gray, the dark color on my gloves, and then I'll touch one of these and make a mess. So. I'm not going to bother with those until the end. These have a lot of floor on them, but I have a thing I can hold on to, so I'll do this next. These are the inside corners. There's two of those. to kind of work the paint into the texture otherwise it'll skip over and even though you want the variation and the wash will bring it out if the base coat is uneven it makes the variation becomes even more uneven and it sometimes isn't it just doesn't look good so this way you can get a lot more control if that makes sense on the variability and variation that you paint in later you can see there, for example, the, the paint didn't get into the printing tech, the texture of the stone. So sometimes have to go around and work it, work it in a little bit. And we make sure we get the these done, even though like a piece like this will be surrounded by other tiles, and this base usually won't show. Um, sometimes, you know, there's a little gap you look down into it, you want the color to be uniform. Or sometimes you might just have this be on the outside, you might just have a floor with a stone pillar. And then you, and this is all nicely done on the outside. One inside corner, that's the other inside corner. Do this bit first. 
first because that's the part that most likely to be forgotten. second or third of these you start to figure out how best to get the paint in and it looks like working with like the contours of the stone helps get it into those little textural crevices better and then just you know, doing the edges here you catch up catch the bits here it wouldn't ordinarily So that's, that's okay. It's going on pretty well and with a wash on it. It'll show a lot of vari variation. It'll look like a dirty floor. Look like things spill on it. Looks like people trod on it. That sort of thing. What I'm going to work on next is we've got these corner spots, these corner pieces. I'm just piling everything up here. Yeah, I think I'll do this one. This is the narrow corridor piece. I'll get through here this out of the way this was this was uh, probably the biggest paint to paint getting the walls painted and then getting the demarcation line the boundary line because there's little bits of the stone printed into the base of the walls so, this is a pretty cool piece but not the easiest to, to complete Ten corners. These are interesting. They have by far the most wall area, other than that one dungeon corridor, but not very much floor area. So they, they should go pretty quickly, especially since the boundary area was already painted. So really slow to do the walls. Really quick to do the floors. I'm down nine to go.
Yep, so just quietly plugging away, painting floors. Swirling the brush around. Fortunately, the paint is very forgiving. Well, there's a lot of texture marks on the floor. You need to work the paint in. And I found that that kind of swirly thing um, does the best job of getting the paint into the fine, the fine little crevices that you've got from the print. I don't need to be like hyper accurate with getting everything in because when the black wash comes on it'll cover a lot of that but the more uniform it is to start with the easier it is to control the variation when we put that in with the wash so it starts out uniform in order to look randomly non-uniform later That's how it works. So swirling it around gets into the little swirly marks. Yeah, and, and that actually did better than when I first started without the swirls. This large brush has pretty nice bristles. They're not extremely soft, but they hold the paint well and they're just stiff enough to really get into those, those little groove things that are otherwise a pain to paint. Yeah, the first one or two when I was just painting it straight, the little print marks, the texture on the stone wasn't getting wasn't getting covered, but this technique seems to be working better. And at some point I'm gonna to have to wash this because the paint is actually starting to gum up on the brush. So I'll do like one more corner and then I'm going to wash the brush. It starts getting too stiff and then the paint doesn't come off the brush onto the surface, and the surface ends up looking, uh, yeah, I mean the paint just, the brush just pulls the paint back off, instead of laying it down. So, I'm like a little more than half through with the floors here, so it's a good time. You know, to clean the brush before going on to the rest. I'm just gonna do that. This doesn't have to be real thorough, but enough to get the gumminess out, especially on the bristle part. <laughs> so it's soft again and not 
impossible to work with. Yeah, there's a lot of paint stuck in there. So, do that. Get a little drink of milk in here. another bite of toast. Got some more corners. This one is Okay, so I'll paint this one next. This is the corridor tile with the trap. And the trap is in the wall, which is over there because it uh, goes in and out. The peg aligns it, and the magnets that you can't see here and here hold it in place while you're playing. Is a pretty cool thing. We have two traps. One is a flame and one is a gas cloud. I've done flames before. Yellow, orange, and red and they come out pretty well. We just did one for the ritual chamber. Uh, I'll be doing one looking pretty much the same for this. I haven't done a gas cloud before so I have to think about you know what color is kind of you know you always have to have sickly green in a gas cloud so there'll be some of that but then contrasting colors maybe 
kind of a yellowish white color to go with it. Some highlights of another contrasting color just to make it look a little scarier. No, we'll see. Probably have to paint it like two or three times before we're happy with how it ends up looking. So we've got uh, one, two, like four walls here. And these will be painted. And then the floor for the trap wall, which will be easy. And then two regular floors. Nothing but floor. No walls at all. Those will be the last ones I'll do because I'll get paint on my glove from getting those done. And then I'll be able to, I don't want to paint anything after that without taking a glove off. So those will be the last ones I do with the floor color. And then what I'll be doing is working on the doors a little bit. And then after that, I'll be working on the door frames. And that probably take us really close to the end time by the time I'm done with those. So I think we will be not doing brick highlights today. That's going to take like another hour and a half or so. I mean, I might do one or two just to show people what it is we're doing, but uh, depending on how fast everything else goes, we're probably going to finish the floors and the door and the door frames today. Each other. This is good. We've got an more than enough paint in this jar to finish this job, which is good. Didn't really want to open another fresh jar of paint just for like one floor tile, which has happened in the past. This has got enough paint in it to finish these floors and still have a little bit needed, needed for like touch up or another small job that requires this color. here. Ah, welcome. So, yeah, getting really close to finishing up the base coat on the floors of this dungeon set. If anybody has just tuned in or hasn't been watching, I'm going to raise the camera and it around a little bit so that you can see <laughs> the extent of uh, what's working on here. We've got, I think, more than 20 in this particular set. <laughs> Almost all corners in the Dungeon of Doom. Small rooms, narrow corridors, locked doors, traps. It should be a very, very unpleasant place to visit. So we're painting a kind of uh, dismal colors, gray walls, dark gray floors, black wash on everything. Just want to make it look really quite uninviting. It's not the kind of place that you adventure in because, uh, you know, you think that it might be a nice art gallery or something. No, it's the kind of place that you're forced to go into 
because of the circumstances, like you have to save somebody or retrieve an object or something. So with trepidation, you go into the Dungeon of Doom, uh, get through the front door somehow, even though it's locked, you know, because it's not inviting. Maybe you break it down, maybe you dimension door through it or something. Maybe one of your party teleports through onto the inside and opens it from the inside. Maybe they teleport in and then find out that they can't open it from the inside and they're trapped alone. You know, something like that could happen. And then you get inside and, uh, and you're, you're so excited about getting inside that you don't detect traps and you set one off and somebody's seriously injured before you even get started. And then you see this really nice big room without any lights in it. So somebody finally breaks out a lantern or a torch or something. And you can see that there's a door on the other side of the room and you say, well, there's nothing in this room. I guess we need to go through the door. And once again, it's locked. And you spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out how to get into it. And then when you finally do, you find that it's just this narrow little corridor that's about 20 feet long and about 5 feet wide. So you have to go single file through the door. And you detect traps. And there is one. But so what? I mean, you detected it. It doesn't mean you disarmed it. So you draw lots and you send somebody out ahead and they set off the trap. Maybe it's the person who was injured before so that, you know, they're already injured. So what the heck, right? Well, I heard somebody else, somebody new, you might need them later. And you set off that trap. And then, uh, and then something comes, you know, and you find out that you're not alone in the corridor and you have to do a little bit of battle, which is going to be hard because you're all single file and you can't even all fit in the room in the hall all at once. And the wrong people went in first. And so that gets to be a trial. And then there's a door at the end of that corridor. And that door is locked. And you break, finally get through that after all sorts of machinations and mishaps and things. You know, somebody pulls out a crowbar or something and jams it open, or somebody has lock picking skills and after the 17th attempt finally succeeds. And then you get into the last room, and lo and behold, there are no more traps. Such a deal. But then, then you have to deal with whatever, whatever is in there. You know, something probably pretty nasty that will, uh, after all of that, create an epic battle. And then, if you survive that, you get the treasure, which turns out to, you know. Turns out to have been plundered a long time ago, and you're just, you're just really sad and, and beat up and in need of a long rest. But then, then a, a magical being appears out of another plane, like the astral plane or something, and big angel wings and things, things like that, and bestows on you all a bunch of platinum for your bravery. And it turns out that all of this wasn't wasn't what it really seemed to be, but it was just a test that was contrived by beings from another plane and you survived the test and you're all very happy about that and you get a wonderful reward. That's the twist. And basically you're really not pleased about it because it was an awful test. And there wasn't any reason for it. They could have just asked you something like a couple of math questions or a grammar test or something. But no, you have to go through all of that. But, you know, you get a prize. Maybe even level up. That would be kind of fun. That's the kind of thing that could happen in the Dungeon of Doom.
So now this whole thing has to be painted the same color. So that's why, why I kept the gloves on. So I'm done painting all of the stuff where I don't have the gloves. I'll have to come back and paint a little bit where I do have the gloves and then yeah, we'll see. Usually this paint is pretty forgiving and it's all on the side here, so it's not going to show. So I'll do three out of the four, pretty much except for the corners, and then we'll just set it down here, touch these other corners, paint this part. And then go back to the corners that I painted and then touched. To see how much touch up I need on top of it. It's all the same color, so it's not like I'm smudging anything. You know? could have gotten one of these. Huh, yeah, I could have done this. I'll do it on the next one. Tiki tack, tiki tack thing. Put it on there. Hold it on like that instead of making a mess. But, you know, I've been doing this now for three and a half hours and uh, maybe not quite as sharp as I might have been. Sharp, that's a good word, isn't it? Yes, I was. But look at that. Huh. Did it? Uh, now I can paint this way up close to the camera. Without getting paint all over my gloves. Yeah, you're getting a really big magnified view of. Yeah, I'll just leave it there with that. View uh, the stone floor. I'm doing a swirly thing because the pattern, the pattern in the uh, stone, has lots of tiny little ridges, and doing this works the paint into those ridges about as well as anything else. That doesn't take forever to do. two of these holders and two of those floor tiles. What a coincidence. There was just enough of each to make it have work. But no, the first one just got lucky. tiles to make sure that I painted the floors on all of them. So I'm stand up and look around. And it looks like the floors are painted on all of them. So I can put away this paint and do that. Wash out this brush and then probably just leave it in the water because it's really charcoal of field blue paint. Wash that out in the sink a little bit later, but at least now I'll get most of the paint out of it so that some of the rest of it can kind of dissolve out. Okay, and what I'm going to be doing next is um, working on the doors that I had been working on earlier. I had painted the panels uh, dark scar scarlet red that is meant to be 
not inviting. Okay. What I'm going to do next is paint these bars. These bars are going to be a metallic color. I think I'll paint the bottom bar, bottom two, even though it looks like it's part of the outer frame. I'm going to paint that the metallic too and see how it looks. And then uh, after that's dried, I will paint the outer frame that's going to be uh, black, flat black, as is the door frames that I painted some time ago. These parts will be flat black. So the door will be framed in black with red panels and uh, metallic bars. Those, you know, bars to make it strong. I'm going to be using the Viejo Metallic. These are really good metallic paints. It has a fair amount of black in it, so it's a darker color. Not as dark as the steel that we often use, but not a real I mean, it's shiny metallic. But it's not bright like silver or chrome. I think, like, believe it or not, with even two little drops of that might be enough to do all three doors. It get, it's a lot of coverage. A little bit of paint. Right up to the edge of those bars. Pretty shiny. I might need to use a darker color. We have another one that's called Steel that has a lot more black in it. Um, I'm going to check a color chart here in a second. Okay, well, this is too shiny. So even though I just got started on it, I'm going to give up on this color. I have this other thing called dark aluminum, which is not as dark as the steel. It has more black in it. Give up on this cup, too. I'll just set that one aside. I have two other doors to work with. But that's way too bright. I'm going to try the dark aluminum. And if that doesn't work, then we'll revert back to the steel. I have to find that color, though. I'll be right back. This is dull aluminum. Um, of course, the one color that I want is the one color that I can't find. So, as we're experimenting, I'm going to take the other side of this door since it's already going to get repainted. 
I'm going to put one drop of dull aluminum in this, which is a metallic color, but it has kind of a matte finish on it. I'm thinking with the Dungeon of Doom that we might not want it that shiny. So let's see what happens. This is nice thing about paints is that you can try different things and see how they look. So you know it's kind of like a, the same color category as that, but it's once it dries it'll be flat. It's still too bright, I think. When we want things to look too shiny. Otherwise it's just gonna look like a like cheap hotel door or something. Um, and that's not what really what we have in mind. Okay, so two failures. <sighs> Get another cup here. And we're just going to go, I think, with the old standby a steel. Yeah, the dull, and that's kind of nice. Is a silvery color without it being too too bright, but it's too white, too shiny. So I'm going to get out the old steel. Someday we're going to have to get more of this. This is much darker. It's metallic, but quite dark, and I think that'll look best. We've used this quite a lot on the doors. It looks pretty good. So I'll do uh, the two doors that haven't been painted with this color. And then the uh, one that I have started will probably be dry enough to paint over. at that, that nice dark look that we're looking for here which is probably why we end up using this paint all the time because it just that is what we're hoping to have done in terms of a, in terms of being both metallic and dark yeah much I mean it's much better much more much more what we're looking at for this particular set. So the old standby stood by us one more time. Yeah, it's a little bit peeped into the corner there. I have to decide later whether to touch that up again or not. Make sure I get up into the door frame. The door frame is going to be painted black. So, you know, it kind of slopped over, but this is pretty much how the door is going to look. This will be painted flat back. Black. I need to do a little touch up there because the paint is very thin and it's just kind of pulled up in the corner a little bit. But that'll be just a tiny little bit of red touch up.
And sometimes your brush brush flip. Spot, but you don't want it, so it'll be another tiny dot. Red touch up. So you got two red touch up dots on this floor. Usually I'm pretty good about this and we don't need any touch up, but for some reason near the end of four hours here. Things are a little bit less than wonderful in terms of brush control. Okay, well, other than making a mess on a couple of the panels here, you can barely see it, but, you know, it's pretty obvious and it needs a touch-up. Yeah, yeah, that looks pretty good. So there's one out of three. See if we do a little better on this one or not. Seriously? Okay, well. There's enough little blots on the red that it will make getting the red paint out uh, worthwhile. I did it there. I'm not even sure how it got there. I'm just painting the other direction. But oh, there it is. That red paint is kind of thick. It's going to be a, yeah, not the easiest thing to do to touch up, but you need to do what you need to do.
so I'm getting close to uh, I'm done with this set of bars on the doors. Even though that bottom is technically part of the frame, it, it really does need to be metallic. So I'm going to leave it metallic. I'm going to paint the and do then the other one too. Yeah. Paint the bottoms here in case some of it shows. See that there. This one, I'll just do um, a little bit of metallic right along, right along the sides there, just to make sure the corner is covered. So yeah, um, that was one out of four panels where I didn't make a mess on the red. Okay, <clears throat> so this was the one, the dual aluminum. That was the dull aluminum. There's not too much difference. And you can see they're both way too bright for what we're trying to achieve here. So this will make them disappear. And now it'll be darker. Seeing them next to each other, you can really see the contrast in the brightness. Of it. And how if you want it to look doomy as opposed to, you know, welcoming. We want the darker color. didn't mess up on that one either. So, flip it over. We have a double aluminum. Mm, it's kind of a cool thing. I might use it some other time on something. But definitely not a thing to do on this store. And again, when you put them next to each other, oh, jeez. Yeah. Let's make sure that we get our money's worth out of that next drop of scarlet paint. And when you get them next to each other, you can really see the difference in uh, brightness.
And just about in time. He's just about dried up and gone. with the red touch up because who knows what's going to happen with the black paint the way things are going here um, yeah so looks pretty good and then that'll be black pretty much as it is but without the swapping over so we're done with the metallics here clean off this brush again uh, we're going over time, but I think I want to get the door frames done. Probably take another 20 minutes or so, so yeah, what the heck. Go a little bit longer, eat lunch. And then we'll be to the point where we just need to do all of the brown... I like bricks. So that's pretty much dry. So move all this stuff out of the way. Put three door frames. We'll do those. And then the doors. And then after the doors are done, um, I'll get the red paint out, put a drop of paint in the in a cup and um yeah then we'll be done with that so now i need this nice dark black color <clears throat> kind of a charcoal black so it'll be a little bit lighter than the primer black but it looks really good when it dries Really a nice charcoal -y color. Get the brush saturated here. to be kind of clean. dries pretty quickly so you can see how it's just a lighter color than the, than the black primer. At least it goes on shiny when it's wet so you can see where the edges are. I'll do the other side here now. Just over the edge of the corner here. Okay, now I'll do 
I'm only doing the fiddly bits first. And then I'll do the inside. I'll do that with the small brush too. It'd be better with the bigger brush, but no, not, not for the bit that's that's not it isn't that much. It'll just take a little longer. But it'll be a little more precise too. Painting this black could do it in steel, but I mean we want it to look dungeony, and that means that the doors would be pretty secure. So if I painted a wood color, I mean it would look woody, it'd be brown, and the contrast would be there. But it's kind of like oh yeah, a swift kick. This way, you no, know, maybe it's wood painted black. Or maybe it's actually metal, like the door. Yeah, so it's going to be, you know, not the kind of thing that you can just have your half work and Patreon and your party just dash into it and knock it down. So. So the black, the black is, you know, it's a nice color, but it's also, you know, it could be metal or wood, depending on how difficult the DM wants the entry into the dungeon to be. Like you might want it easy to get in the front door, because you want people to get into the dungeon. That way you can mess with them. But then the inner doors, they, oh yeah, that outer one, that was just wood and it was half rotted and it just gave way right away and then all of a sudden you find out, oh no, it's painted the same color but it's made out of uh, some super strong metal. And then you find yourself trapped in the hallway. Those things happen. Okay, so that's one door frame. Yeah, that, that'll look pretty good. So, I'm gonna put that there. Do another one. It's getting a little gummy. It didn't flow very well, especially for doing this part of it. Hmm. 
This is one of those bits where you go, yeah, I'm trying to be really careful. And then you don't put enough paint on the brush and it just doesn't, it doesn't work. So you have to dip that in a little bit more than I would have otherwise. And then I'm going to just kind of come on the far side of the corner. Just so it's clear that the lintel goes around. Yeah. Now we'll do the other side. Move but not on the floor. Contact point there is with the floor. It's a little bit easier. It doesn't show quite as much. Side bit here, figure out where the floor color is. Once that's done, then I just have to you know, cover the surface. Really rough surface, it's got wood grain, but it doesn't have to be wood, especially if it's a dark color like this. If you don't wash it, the grain doesn't show, and so it could be, like I said, it could be some sort of super hard metal that keeps you from getting away from the things you want to flee. to do and then touch up the doors with the black and then touch 
tiny bits of scarlet red on all the blobs that I messed up on, which is really annoying, but so it goes. So we're going a little longer than usual, by probably close to an hour, but I kind of wanted to get these things done. And since I was down here already painting, might as well just keep going for another bit. You know, it's not like I have to cook dinner tonight or anything, like some nights. That side done, now I'll do this side. You know, it was like landscaping yesterday. It was a really nice day. Yeah, we, we just moved two and a half yards of topsoil, which is a lot of dirt. Those are cubic yards, that is a cube. Three by three by three. And there are two and a half of those of dirt that was wet, so it was heavy. And then we have to put it into a wheelbarrow and take it to where we wanted to dump it and then shovel it out of the wheelbarrow and then tamp it down. Anyway, that was a lot of work. So it was like, oh, well, it's you now still not raining. So let's move some rocks. So we move some river rock. into two different places and then it was oh well there's you know we need some better drainage up in front and we have this leftover smaller diameter river rock let's move that finally it was yeah we there's other things to be done but they would take the better part of an hour just to set up much less finished so we were sensible enough to quit but it was one of those one more thing one more thing so it's just like today, you know, it's just like, oh, well, this will only take a few minutes, so let's add another 10 minutes to it all and get it done. But then the door frames will be done and the doors will be done. And all we need to do then, all we need to do then is do you know, the highlight bricks. That takes a while. And then after that, if you're doing the highlight bricks, uh, do a wash on um, everything. I'm not sure if this is on camera, but I need to hold it in a way that I can see what I'm doing. Okay. I just need to do the inside of this one. Down along the base of the floor. There. Run some paint across the top of this ridge thing here. That's the door stop, basically. 
keep the door from sliding. It opens this way. It keeps it from opening that way. And then uh, this bit here. And then I'll go to the doors themselves and paint the outsides of those the same color. And then I'll get a tiny little drop of scarlet and touch up all those spots that have steel on them that should be red. So there, those are the door frames. Now I'll go back to the doors here. <coughs> so I want to paint the whole outside of this. Um, so I'm going to hold that. Actually, I'm just going to hold it with my fingers. If I use that clip, I use that clip, it'll probably take the metallic paint off. Um, I know. Pop. We're going to do this. That'll hold it. And I've got two of these. So what I'm going to do is paint to this one. Let it dry, put one on here and paint it, and by the time I come back to this, hopefully it'll be dry enough to take it off. up the splotches and makes for a pretty decent looking door edge. Let's do the sides while I'm at it. bottom and then we'll just do this side too it's a doorknob on this one that will have to be painted maybe steel I don't know just a little touch up only one with a doorknob the other one's don't weird Same treatment. And all the scabby edges disappear.
looks okay, so I'm going to let that one set and dry. Pull out the next one. Uncore, presumably. Insert the painted bit into the sticky deck. And do the same thing to this. Make all the scab edges disappear into the charcoal black. finish these things up. Probably nap time after this. These doors look pretty good. They look pretty uninviting, which is the point. Go on the sides here, because the sides do show when, the, especially when the door is open. First one off, which hopefully will be dry enough to do that. Yeah, this one's really messy. Yet. Definitely needs to be painted over. Okay, so we'll set this one here. Take this one off the sticky tag. Set it there. Take the one that's left off the clip. Do the same routine for this. And then uh, pull out the red and do touch up for all the spots that I made a mess on that really didn't need to be messed up. They were. Hmm, what was happening with that? And there are all these little spots all over the place from the steel. I've done these doors like a 
dozen times and never had that happen, but today, like four out of the six panels have a spot on Interesting, the, uh, the black paint doesn't adhere to the steel paint very well. Sometimes it peels off and I have to go over it. Set this up here behind this other one. Go back to the first one I did, which should be drying, and do the red touch up. And if I don't mess that up, <coughs> and I don't have to do the steel over again, these are just tiny little dots of paint. We will be done with the doors and the door frames, so I need to make sure this is fairly clean. We need black in the red, I mean, it actually wouldn't look terrible, but no sense. So what I'm going to be doing, since I'm looking at just tiny little dots of paint, I'm going to shake this up and just use the paint from like the squeeze instead of squeezing it into a cup. That would be too much. So, let's start with this one. Oh, for God's sake. No, yeah, it just didn't cover well. Okay, well, I'm going to have to go back over it with the charcoal again. But let's take care of this first. No, it's not going to work. Find another cup.
Yeah, see, like right along here. Somehow the charcoal needed to go a little further and it just just didn't get there. Anyway. Here. See that tiny spot? No tiny spot needs to be red. Ta-da. And those spots down there, that needs to be red. Yeah, it looks it's really bright, but it it tones down when it dries, and so it'll match. And we look on this side, and that side isn't bad. So we'll set that there. This one is the next most to dry. And there's the spot there that needs to be red. You know what it is. Tiny spot there that needs to be red. charcoal back out again and do uh, charcoal touching up. Yeah, there's a big block there. Let me see that. Okay, so we wasted a little drop of red because we hardly needed any of it, but so it goes. And then we'll get the charcoal out again and go around the outsides of the doors. But they just really don't, man, they just don't look right. So just a little bit, a little bit of work on those. But I'll be able to I'll take my glove off here at this point. Be able to hold them here on that spot. Put around the edges, so we'll get the charcoal back out. And do door frame touch up. Choosing one at random. There. There's that random. So what I need to do is A bunch of paint because this doesn't adhere to the brush very well. Get closer up to the edge. It's not too bad there. Let's see what the other side looks like. Okay, that one's not too bad. It's done. Get the stand up. Now I'm going to just do a little leaning there. This one, you know, this one needs, needs up here. Let's see up there, especially here. This spot there that needs to be painted. Not bad on that side. It's not good down here, so that's an opportunity to fix that. Yeah, this side definitely like down here, there, here, just needed be closer to the edge. Like I just didn't quite get to the edge where I painted it. Okay. 
Okay, that's the key now. Bring that one up here. And do this last one. <laughs> That one was the worst one in terms of uh, just needing to be touched up, but looks like I got that pretty well. Let's see what the other side looks like. Same sort of thing here. Okay, there. So I think I think we're going to call this a success. I think these doors. Now, if you look at them now, that looks pretty good dungeoning. It looks like a good, a good dungeoning door. even weathered already. The red didn't cover very completely, so it looks kind of worn. The steel is a little mottled. The gray is good. The door frames look good. Yeah, I think we're pretty much down to that. We got the base coat on the walls and the floor. We got the door frames and the doors done. Um, probably on the trap plates, you know, the things that are going to be brass, probably won't paint those until after the washing is done, because we want those to stay shiny. So the next steps are to um, put in the highlight bricks. We'll do that starting on Monday. Mickey will be with us then. We'll each uh, go at it. We'll each start tackling them and then when that's done Nick you'll do the washing or maybe I'll get started early and do highlight bricks but either way uh, she'll start doing the washing and that'll look good and then we'll finish that up uh, on Monday this set will be done and we'll set it back up again so everybody can see it oh yeah while she's doing the washing I'll be doing the flame and the gas cloud and Oh, of course, it, I always forget these, you know. I'll just do... I'm just not going to pull the paint out again. <laughs> these are the lintels, the tops of the doors. They go like this. And the uh, holes are where the door pin hinges go through. And I didn't paint those the charcoal color. So they need to be painted that color. Oh, and these holes got need to be drilled out too. Yeah, those are going to take a little bit of effort. Some of them either got filled with paint when they were primed, or they were they didn't come out completely clearly when they were printed. I'm guessing it's primer paint. Uh, so yeah. Those will, those will take a little more work. I'm glad I didn't bother trying to do those today. Because those need to be drilled out with a little uh, finger drill before I paint them. There's just some extra glue or something on here. I'm not sure what. But it doesn't need to be there. I'll take that off now. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to leave these right up in front so that they are not forgotten next week. 
Okay, well, this went a little bit longer than usual, but I got a lot of stuff done. Uh, there's dungeons that can be completed next week, and we'll show what that looks like. And if we have both cameras up, we'll show you what the other dungeon sets look like when they've been painted and put together. So thanks for watching, and goodbye.